Thank you. Uh, the presentation time is 30 minutes, and that will be followed by a 10-minute question and answer session. Please give a warm welcome to Murillo. Thank you. So can you, uh, so my name is Murillo. Uh, I'm going to be talking about data science and Jupiter and all these things. Maybe before I start, it would be interesting to know, maybe by a show of hands. Do you guys use Jupiter a lot? Do you guys know what Jupiter is? Yeah? Could you raise your hand if yes? Yeah? Yeah? Do you use it a lot? Yeah, you use it a lot? Do you like Jupiter? Do you have any problems with it? No? Okay, okay. So it's going to be an easy crowd, I feel, right? Like everyone loves Jupiter, but okay. So um, this is the agenda for today. Um, I'm going to start, well, by introducing the agenda. If I already lost you, you are here. So just letting you know. Um, we're going to talk a bit about like data science in the wild, right? So what do I see there, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, we're going to talk about like Jupyter Notebooks. So the previous talk was about how Jupyter Notebooks work like in the, in the sockets and everything, right? So we're going to focus really on the actual art artifact. So the actual notebook itself, the file. Uh, so we're going to talk about what it is, the role of Jupyter Notebooks in data science. We're going to discuss some issues with notebooks as well. Uh, we're going to discuss some existing solutions. And then I'm going to introduce the, a tool that I built because uh, I saw a lot of issues with notebooks. And uh, that's called Databooks. So yay. OK. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to have a demo, right? Because I think if it's a tool and you don't show it, it's like you should really be skeptical, right? So we're going to do some coding. We're going to show some stuff, how it works. Hopefully it goes well, right? Because live demos is always, uh. So OK. I'll, I did some prayers before, so let's hope it all, <laughs> all goes well. Um, then I'm going to talk a little bit about what it does and also how it works. Cool? Everyone's with me? Everyone's excited? Yeah? Yeah? OK, cool, cool. Let's hope it stays like this. So uh, first and foremost, uh, just who am I? Right? So my name is Murillo. Um, this is my contact. I'm actually from Brazil. Uh, maybe fun fact, if I'm here, maybe I don't know if it's fun, but uh, I'm half blood Japanese, but that's about it. I don't speak any Japanese, so don't, don't expect anything from me, so I apologize for that. Uh, I currently live in Belgium, uh, where I work. Uh, I have a bachelor's in mechanical engineering, so that's my background. I have a master's in artificial intelligence at KU Leuven, so that's a, a university in Belgium as well. I have some certifications here, so not super relevant for this talk, but I am a like, data engineer, machine learning engineer certified from Google, uh, machine learning for AWS, for HashiCorp, so that's their form certification, uh, astronomer for Airflow, and Snowflake. I'm also certified with Snowflake recently, right? I'm a coach and I'm a tech lead for the AI business unit at Dataroots, so that's the company that I work with. Um, but this is not, uh, not going to be a talk about my company at all. Uh, and I'm a machine learning engineer there, right? So what is a machine learning engineer in my eyes, right? So what do I do? What is my role? So the way I see my role is as a data a machine learning engineer consultant is to help having businesses put their ideas into production, right? So how can you, you have an idea, you, you have some data, you try some things, and now you want to actually put it to use, right? So in doing so, there are a lot of issues that pop up, right? Um, sometimes, well, a popular one, I would say, is the, the friction between the data scientists and the data engineers, right? So I think they have very different profiles and they have very different interests as well. So that's one point that we see a lot of friction, yeah? Uh, but another thing too, so that, I, that we also see interestingly, is some friction between data scientists themselves, right? And I think the big part of that, so if I'm working with user, and I'm trying to share something with you, a lot of the times there are issues, right? And the reason for that is because data scientists love notebooks, right? It's just like, it's like a match made in heaven, right? Like data science and notebooks, yay. Okay, um, so what are these notebooks? Okay, uh, if you watched the previous talk, you probably know quite a lot, but if you haven't, I'll do a brief intro. So it's an interactive uh, environment, so meaning that you can run little bits of code and then you can see the outputs for each bit. So it's also really good for people that are learning. I actually learned to code with Jupyter Notebooks. It's very friendly. Um, it runs on your browser. So if you do like Jupyter Lab and stuff, you're going to see. And we're also going to see an example later on. Uh, it is stateful. So if you create a variable, it will stay there for you. And then you can actually retrieve it afterwards. Um, the format is this IPy and B. So I think when I asked in the beginning, most of you know Jupyter Notebook is R, right? So I don't think this comes as a surprise. Uh, if you open it up, actually, you, when you want to see what's inside, it's just JSON, 
right? So we're going to look into it a bit more afterwards, but it's really just JSON. And the kernels is basically what is running there, right? So usually you, you associate that with Python, but sometimes you can have R kernels, you can have Julia, you can have Spark uh, within Scala or PySpark as well, right? So Jupyter is not necessarily tied into Python, but it's often associated with Python. Okay? Cool? Cool. This is how it looks like if you haven't seen one before, which I would be surprised based on a quick poll in the beginning of the talk. Uh, but this is what I'm talking about here, right? So you have some cells. You have different types of cells as well. You run some code, and then you can actually get the output right underneath. So it's also good, and this is a good example why it's good in data science, because for a data scientist, you get some data, and you want to see what's in there, right? Like a lot of the times, one thing that we also see, businesses come and say, like, okay, I have this data, and we can predict when a customer is going to leave. But then you actually try to do some things, and it's like, well, you, the data doesn't have the patterns that you're looking for, right? So a lot of the times you get stuff, and you really just need to explore. You don't really know what to expect. And I believe, this is my personal belief, that no notebooks are really good for these types of situations, right? Also, if I have a graph, I want to show like the histogram or something. It's really easy for me to share with you, and you can actually see, easily see, ah, okay, I see what you're talking about. I can actually add some notes and everything. So I personally believe that notebooks are good in the exploration phase. Uh, this is also maybe a side note that my personal belief is that once you do know what you want to do, I personally think that you should move away from notebooks, okay? Um, and that's the friction between the data engineers and data science. Yeah? Okay. But we're not going to talk much about that, so don't worry. Okay? Cool, cool. Everyone with me still? Yeah? Yeah? Okay? Okay. Cool. Okay. Did I skip a slide or no? No. Yeah. Okay. So where do we see notebooks, right? Notebooks is like super flexible, it's super cool. So you can actually do quite a lot of it. Uh, like I said, it's very popular in data science and that's why you can see a lot in Kaggle. You see a lot of notebooks in Kaggle, it's really easy to share, it's re I mean, it's very related to data science as well, right? So it makes sense. Um, some people actually write notebooks, uh, not notebooks, they write books with Jupyter as well, so you can actually do that. Uh, FastAI, do you guys know what FastAI is? Yeah, no? So FastAI, they actually have a lot of uh, courses and they use notebooks to teach, right? So people do courses on that. If you look at the three big cloud providers, right, you have Vertex AI from Google, you have Amazon SageMaker, and you have uh, Azure ML, they all have uh, a notebook environment, right? Because, well, they know that in data science, you, they really love it. It's the match made in heaven, remember? The heart, yeah? So uh, they do that. Google Colab as well is a nice place, especially if you want to get started. You don't have to install anything. You just go on your drive and you have like a, a VM there and everything, right? So very popular. And even Papermill. And this one is controversial, so I'm not going to go into the merit of that. Uh, do you guys know what Papermill is? No? So Papermill is a way that you can put Jupyter Notebooks in production, right? So you actually execute it. Um, if, you, yeah, if you're paying attention before, I, I personally don't like that approach, but it does exist. And I think big companies actually have had success with this as well. So who am I to say anything, right? But uh, not my personal choice, let's say. Okay, so not everything is great with notebooks, of course, right? Um, so this here on the, on the left is actually a tweet from Joe Gruss. Do you guys know who that is? Have you heard of him? Yeah, yeah. Um, he actually did a talk, so this is a, for me, I felt like it was a very bold move, right? He went to JupyterCon, and he actually did a talk on, I don't like notebooks. Have you ever seen that talk? No? It's a, it's a really interesting talk. It's, I actually quite liked it. Uh, I mean, I don't share all the, the opinions, right? But I, I do think it was very interesting. And this person on the left here, that is not amused at all, that is actually my coworker, uh, Nico Gelders. He, and he's a data engineer, and he does not like notebooks. I think, well, now in Belgium, he may be sleeping because it's Saturday morning for him, but I'm sure that he's rolling his bed right now. I was like, oh, no, notebooks. Like, oh, someone said something. Oh, no. He hates notebooks. And if I'm being honest, too, I like notebooks, but I've had my, my share of, uh, of issues with them as well, right? Specifically, when you talk about Git. Uh, because I think Git is a very software engineering-oriented tool, and notebooks, a lot of the times, don't cope well with Git. Yeah? Yeah? I see some nodding. You guys probably experienced this at some point, no? Just me? Yeah, yeah, okay, okay cool, cool. So yeah, you know, you must be really glad you're here because that's exactly what I was trying to solve. Cool? Cool. All right, so there are some solutions to this issue, right? Like I, I wasn't the first one, like you saw. A lot of you guys also had this issue as well. Um, the first solution that I see is let's just not use notebooks, 
uh, which I guess it is a solution, but I do think there's still a lot of value from notebooks, right? Even if, uh, even if you have these issues, there's a better way of dealing with this. Another uh, worthy mention is JupyText. Have you heard of JupyText, anyone? No? JupyText is, uh, is a way that you can actually take your notebooks and they will be created for scripts and they're synced. So every notebook will have a corresponding script and whenever you change the notebook or the script, they will sync each other. Okay? That's one, that's one solution. NBCLEAM is a CLI tool for cleaning metadata uh, from notebooks. Uh, NBDIME, have you ever heard of NBDIME? That's a big one. So it's a way that you can actually diff notebooks um, and also merge. The diffing actually happens in a browser as well, so you still have to have to open the browser to see the, the nice diff. And the uh, merging, you have to do the merge, like you, you do the merge with the tool, right? So you have to know you have notebooks that you're gonna merge, and you have to use the tool before that, okay? Uh, NBDev, ever, anyone ever heard of NBDev? That's another big one. Yeah, yeah? So NBDev is a, is a tool that does a lot of stuff, right? And I think by doing so much, it kind of becomes opinionated as well. Uh, but it's a way to build Python packages with notebooks. So it's very like, it's a very library project. I would invite you to have a look at it. They basically take a notebook and from that they create a script. From the notebook as well, they create a static website that is the documentation for your package. Um, they actually have the two-way sync, they have ways to fix issues, they have ways to do this and that. And actually when I saw that, I thought it was an interesting uh, idea, so I actually gave it a try. But I felt it was too opinionated, uh, and I, I didn't have a very good user experience. So actually I created uh, Databooks. Yay. Okay. Um, so there's a big overlap between these things, right? So uh, specifically with NBDev, and I will say that well, there is an overlap, but it's not the same thing. And also the implementation is very different, right? Another thing that I would like to mention is that not too long ago, the people from NBDev, well, I had issues with NBDev. I didn't really like the user experience. And I don't think this, a lot of people didn't like it either. That's why they created NBDev 2, right? So, and then they had this Jupyter Git problem so is now solved, which when I read this, this was in August, uh, a lot of the ways that they're dealing with these things are similar to the way I dealt with it, right? So I'm not like, but again, the implementation is still different, right? But like uh, the way that you compare uh, the diffs in, in notebooks and the cells and everything, that's a very similar thing, right? But the implementation is different and the philosophy of uh, NBDev is still to create packages from notebooks, which is not my intent when I built my tool. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, okay, okay. Everyone's with me still, because now we're getting to the good part. Yeah? Okay, well, I'm gonna assume yes, but uh, if you're watching on YouTube, everyone said yes. Everyone's like super excited, right? Like, yeah, 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 okay. So, uh, Databooks. Um, what is Databooks? Uh, it's a CLI tool, so it's a command line interface. You can think of like black or pip, right? So you just run your terminal. It's about sharing and caring about notebooks. So if you love notebooks and you wanna share them, that's the tool for you. Um, it has an API, so the way I implement it as well is that you can actually use it to manipulate notebooks as well, right? So we actually, I follow the Jupyter protocol, like how this should look like and everything, and I model that. How do I model that? I'll explain later, okay? Um, it's also configurable, so I try to not make it too opinionated so you can actually change how things work, okay? Let's see, what else? So it has four commands. Right, for now, I'm still working on some stuff. This is also a, a, a on the side project, right? So this is not my full-time job, so I also don't have all the time in the world to do it. Uh, but uh, right now, what it can do is it can remove metadata from notebooks, and we're gonna see an example later, it will be more clear. You can also resolve conflicts. So if there's a Git conflict on your notebook, you can use this tool to resolve it more easily. Uh, you can assert metadata, and you can actually have a rich representation of your notebook in the terminal. So it's very CLI oriented, it's very terminal oriented. I'm a terminal person, I think, um, but yeah. So it was kind of like, maybe I had some influence there. You also can have pre-commit hooks. Do you guys know what pre-commit hooks are? Yeah, no? So it's basically something that runs right before you make a commit, and there is also another package that is super popular, makes it super easy to use, called uh, pre-commit, right? So it's uh, not uh, super creative, but uh, I think it works. Um, this is how it looks like, the pre-commit, right? And if you look here, so if you go to precommit.com and you Google, uh, you search for databooks, you're gonna see 
two comments here that you can easily use. And actually, this is something that I personally would recommend for people as well. I think it's a really nice tool. So all this, basically, is just to get Nico to be happy. Hell yeah. So hopefully, I did a good job there. But OK, cool. So it's demo time. Hopefully, you guys are all with me. Can you still hear me well? Yeah? OK. All right. This is the. Yeah? Is this big enough? Yeah? OK? OK. So I have a, a local repo here, and I have my environment here as well. Right? So I have some files. I have demos. So this is the one I'm going to be playing with. Uh, if I do, if I try to show what's inside, then you kind of see more of what a Jupyter Notebook is all about. And you see it's just JSON, right? So you have a, a property here, cells, that has a list, and it has a list of another structure that is a, a, a code cell. Uh, they can have a, a type, so this one is Markdown, which is this one, right? Um, it can be code, or it can also be a raw type, okay? So they all have a source, they all have an execution count, well, for code, right? Uh, they have some ID, so they also have metadata. Uh, they have outputs, well, depending, right? So this one doesn't, but for example, this one does. Um, and you also have a metadata place, which if you see on the first cell here, you have a tag. So actually, you don't see this here. But if you open this here, you can see a yay tag. Woo! Okay, cool. And you don't have any other one, okay? Does this make sense? So this is how notebook looks like, right? Ah, maybe another thing too, and I'll have to go to the bottom. So each cell has metadata, but also the notebook has metadata itself, right? So for example, if you look, uh, I cannot see here. But if I hide this, you see that there is a kernel name, and this is also stored here, right? So you can know. So the, and what I'm trying to get at here is if I share a notebook with any one of you, and I make some more changes, et cetera, et cetera, and you just open it and save it, because you're going to have a different kernel name, or you could have a different kernel name, we're going to have conflicts just by opening it. You don't change anything, but you have conflicts, right? So first thing is, let's try to avoid these conflicts. And how can we do that? Talking books. Yeah. Surprise, right? Okay. Anyways. Uh, so you can install data. Oh, you can just pip install data books, right? This is already installed in this environment, so I'm not gonna have anything. And then it's just a CLI tool, right? So you can type help. You have more information. You have uh, well, there are five, but this one is not implemented yet. So this is something that I want to work in the future. Um, so let's start with metadata. So this is to clear both metadata from the notebook and from the cells, right? So first step into trying to avoid these conflicts when I share stuff is let's remove the unnecessary stuff. So if I do data books, meta, and then help, I also have some sub help comments here. And the way it works is I try to also mirror black a bit, right? So if I do data books, meta, and then pass a path, actually I'm gonna pass the notebook itself, I have this prompt here because I'm actually changing the notebook and I'm rewriting it. So I'm just having this warning prompt, like, are you sure you want to change your actual notebook file? And again, you can also specify this with this yes here, right? So you don't have this prompt. So if I do here, boom. And if I do bet again, so you see that the, the, the metadata is gone for, well, for example, the tags here are gone. The execution count is gone. The outputs are still here. And this is configurable. And that's why I meant by I try not to be too opinionated about these things. So, and feel free to give me a round of applause if it works. See? See? Did it work? Ah, hold on. I don't think this was supposed to. I know, yeah, it's okay. So you see? Ah. I don't think this is clear. All right, let's see, let's see. Yeah, see? So you see that the execution count is gone. The notebook cell tags are also gone, right? And if I go here and do that demo, you see that all of that is gone as well. Right, so basically, I just tried to remove, ah, also the IDs are gone, right? You don't see here in the UI, but the IDs are also gone. So basically, let's try to remove all the stuff that is not really that useful to you, right? So, let's see. So, you can also specify, so again, these are where the other commands go. You can actually say, I don't want to remove outputs, 
right? So I can actually pass in this argument here, no remove out. And then if it works, oh, me, first. Okay, let's just make sure. Right, so if this works well, and again, fingers crossed. Sorry. So if this works, the outputs should actually be there still. And again, you can question me like, why would you want the outputs? You can say, well, the outputs are important, especially in data science, right? Like when you have, yeah, you see here. So for example, especially if you do the infamous uh, train test split in scikit-learn, if you don't have a random seed specified in, you're gonna have always different ones. So you're gonna mess up with your reproducibility. So sometimes you actually do want the outputs there. If you have plots and they're different, you also want to know about these things, right? So everything's very configurable here. Right, and that's, uh, if you don't want to specify everything all the time, you can also specify that in the pyproject.toml. So that's the same as black. So if you do, sorry. Right, so again, you have the same syntax here. So you can actually configure these things so that also happens. And that's why, by default, we don't actually remove outputs. Well, because here I had specified this, that's why I'm removing the outputs. Does that make sense? Yeah? So, bottom line for this is, you can remove the stuff you don't want, but you can actually choose what you don't want, right? And you can actually specify this. You have pre-commit hooks for that, so you don't have to worry about running this all the time. You have all that flexibility. Okay, so now let's say you do want metadata, right? Like, or, no, before that actually, so let's check it out. So, now let's say you, you try, you remove the metadata from notebooks but there's still some stuff that could happen, right? So what happens if you do have a conflict? So let's do git merge, and this suspicious branch here, conflict branch, and oh, there is a conflict, surprise, right? So if I do git status here, you're gonna see that the actual thing that was conflicted is the demo notebook. So if I do, oh, not this, just to see how it looks in the back. Did, I, did this happen, right? Mm -mm -mm -mm, hold on. Sorry, I lied. There we go, okay, now we have the conflict. So I apologize for that. So if I do that demo, you're gonna see how the, note, how the Git conflicts look like, which is also what you would expect from your files, right? You have you have these things here, right? This git uh, conflict tags here. But the thing is, so first is, a lot of the times, the conflict is just on ID, right? So again, stuff that you will control and you probably don't care either, right? But sometimes, so in this case, for example, is the tags that really flagged it. Um, but sometimes you actually have conflicts, uh, legit conflicts, right? There are changes in your notebook and this conflict should be there. The problem is, if I try to just open this naively, what will happen is, this is not a valid notebook anymore. So I cannot actually fix this. So before, if you had to fix this, you had to go manually here on this file and say, okay, I don't want this. So you would delete this line and fix this, et cetera, et cetera. But now with databooks, you can specify databooks fix. And you can actually get back to the JSON contract that Jupyter expects, right? So for the databooks fix this path. Drum roll, yes, fix the conflicts. So if I go back here now, and I open the demo, you see? So basically what we do here is actually go on the git status, we see the previous versions of the file, and then we compare them, we compare the cells, right? So actually this git diff, if I'm being very honest, is not gonna be exactly the same that the git would give you because it's a difference, right? Like in this kind of subjective, how do you compare diffs? Uh, but this is using the standard library there. So we don't parse JSON, we don't change, we don't do regex, anything, nothing like that. We just go to the previous versions and we compare them, right? And then from here, it's much easier to see what changed and it's much easier for you to fix what you want, okay? So, let's see what else. Right, so, now, we saw how to remove metadata and we also saw how once there are issues, how to fix that, right? Even if you remove the metadata and you try to avoid the conflict. So what can you do uh, if you do want metadata though? 
For example, maybe just a side note as well. You see here that maybe you think that this is an issue, but if you look here, it's because this has the A tag and this doesn't. That's why this is also included in the diff, right? We're including everything that the cell has. So these cells, they may seem unimportant to you, but some applications actually depend on these cells. And I do think that paper mill is one of those, right? So you can actually, how can we make sure that the metadata is the way you expected it is? And that's when Databooks assert comes in. Right? So the idea with Databooks assert is that you say, I want to assert that my no notebook has this many cells. It has cell tags. It has this. And then it has a lot of flexibility. So one way you could do this is uh, assert. You can pass an expression. You can say length of the notebook cells is less than, I don't know, 18. And then you can give that a try. Pass it demo.py. So right now, this notebook has more than 18 cells. And that's why it says found issues, and also it access with status one. So if you had this in CI CD, you wouldn't pass. You wouldn't be able to because there's an error, right? But more interestingly, so actually maybe I can change this. So let's say uh, 10. No, maybe not 10. 20, right? And you see that this passes. So basically, you can force people to have smaller notebooks in this context. Or more interestingly, you can do you can use these uh, recipes. So a recipe is really shorthand notation. So if you have a long expression, you don't want to write it all the time. You can use a recipe. For example, uh, I think this sequential execution is a the idea with this is we want to force that the executed code cells are in order, right? So one big issue that we have with Jupyter is. I can start here and I can say, okay, run this, run this. Okay, I can skip these ones. Okay, now I want to print this. Okay, this is, this, okay, no, this is an issue because it's not. And then I want to import this, for example, right? No books allow for that. But a lot of the times, these going back and forth makes the notebooks not reproducible. That's a big issue, right? So that's why I also thought of this uh, recipe with the sequential execution. What this is saying, once again, is making sure that the cells that are executed are in order. Right, so if I do this and I do demo.py, okay. Oh, no, I need to save it, okay. Yeah, so there's an issue here, right? So if I go here, let's do uh, restart kernel and run all cells. So basically, you're gonna run from top to bottom, right? So there's still an issue here, but okay. Okay, now if I do this, this should, so again, look here that the ex exit status is one. If I do this again, now this should pass. Hold on, let's see. Save it, okay, go, yeah. So you see now it all comply with the metadata here, right? And you see the access status code is zero, meaning that there is no error. So with this, what we're basically doing is enforcing that everyone that is contributing to my repo has to basically restart the kernel and run all cells, right? And then you avoid this non-reproducible notebooks issue. Okay, make sense? Okay, okay, okay. So last thing. Uh, Last command, this is the latest one, is the show. So sometimes I don't actually want to open the, the whole browser just to check one notebook. So what I like, what I also added here is a show command that you can basically just print the notebook in your terminal. Okay, so if I do this, cool. Okay, so you basically have a rich representation of your notebook in the terminal, right? So you see it's the same thing here, right? And you also have syntax highlighting as well. Cool? Make sense? This is an easy one. Okay, these are all the, the comments I have for now. And actually this one is a precursor of something else that I would like to do. So let's just go there. All right, all right demo's over. Oof. I would say it was fairly successful, no? Yeah, okay, maybe, no? <laughs> Anyways, um, so uh, how databooks work? Uh, we actually use Pydentic at the, in, the, in the back, right? So that's how we actually, parse all the JSON, we manipulate all the JSON, and we write the JSON, is with Pydentic. Uh, we also, the user-facing stuff, so the actual CLI and the, the nice printing, including the notebook print, is with Rich. Uh, the configuration is Tomly, which actually, the talk right next door, about 3.11, you're not gonna need this after 3.11 anymore, because it's gonna come in. Uh, we also have a, a Git library for Python, right? So that's this. The roadmap. So what I want to do with the show command, I actually want to come up with a diff so have a nice diffing of notebooks in your terminal, right? The same way that you have git diff, I would like to have a databooks diff for notebooks, right? So you can actually check very easily. You don't have to open or install plugins, et cetera, et cetera. I think that could help in with comparing different notebooks, but also uh, that could also help with the pull request 
uh, process, right? If you, if you change your notebook and you make a pull request, right now, what happens is that you basically compare the lines. So the, the diff is not going to be nice. You're not going to clearly see what's the difference between what you're trying to merge and what is merged, right? With something like data books, you can export the prints to an HTML and actually output that as a comment, right? So I already have kind of a plan on how to do this, but I haven't gotten to it yet. And the last thing is I think I have a bias towards CLIs. So I have a lot of CLI support, but one feedback I got is, remember, data scientists love notebooks, right? They don't like the CLI. So one thing, the feedback that I got, and it's on the back of my mind, let's say, is to add more support to actually Jupyter. So basically adding more plugins and extensions to Jupyter instead of doing everything in the CLI. Make sense? And I think there's only one more thing, which is a... Thank you. So thank you to everyone. Thank you for the organizers also of PyCon. And uh, this is the documentation. If you would like to check it out, feel free to check it out. Feel free also to give it a star, to contribute, to create an issue. But yeah, thanks for listening. And uh, yeah, I'll be happy to answer your questions now. Thank you very much. Uh, there are some questions on Slido. Um, so <coughs> first of all, uh, it looks cool. Is there a plan to develop this Jupyter Lab extension? Yeah, yeah. I think I saw the I see the questions here too. Uh, I don't know when this question was sent, but yeah, I answered on the previous slide. I do think it's something that needs to happen. Um, but yeah, I just haven't gotten to it. But if there's a lot of traction, I would be more motivated to work towards this as well, right? But yeah, so the short answer is yes. Okay, and. Uh, this is not really a question, but just a comment. Uh, the library eases pain developers feel when they share notebooks. Thank you for your information. Um, next question is, uh, given that you've presented about data books assert, uh, may I suppose that you're also considering a notebook coding style rule similar to the Python coding style rules? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, so if you mean by coding style, you mean like Flake 8 and Black and all these things. There are, there's a package called NBQA that you can actually use Black and Flake 8 and all these things into Jupyter Notebooks. So you basically will format your Jupyter code like that. Um, I know that there is like the NB Dev, for example, they also have a coding convention, but I don't, I don't have that. I, I don't plan to work on this either. Yeah. Uh, so the next question, which I think you already somewhat answered, what is your further roadmap? My further roadmap, so I think I have, like again, this is like a side project, right? It's not my full-time work. I have some sporadic ideas here and there. It's like, oh yeah, we should do this. Oh yeah, we should do that. Um, these are the big ones that I could think of right now. Or if you go on my GitHub, uh, I also try to list some things there as well that I would like to work on. But if anyone has any suggestions, anything that you feel like would be super useful, I'll be more than happy to hear as well. Okay, so I think the, yeah. Yeah, I think that's all the questions we've got at the moment. So uh, everyone, please give a big round of applause to Murillo. Uh, if you have any further questions and you would like to talk to the speaker directly, please go to the hallway behind us. Um, we ask for your cooperation in not gathering around the stage. Also, sponsors have their own booths, which we encourage you to visit. All participants who have purchased tickets can also participate in the sticker rally at the sponsors' booths. If you collect the specified number of stickers, you can exchange them for a limited edition t-shirt. We look forward to your participation. Thank you.